Thank you, um, Mr. Senate Judiciary. Continuing our discussions at S99. Uh, our next witness is Sarah Robinson from the Vermont Network Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, for the record, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Thank you very much for taking testimony on S99 this morning and for the thoughtful conversation that you all have been having with the previous witnesses this morning. Uh, the network supports S99, and we believe that this builds on the important statutes of limitations reform that the legislature enacted several years ago uh, when you all repealed the civil statute of limitations on child sexual abuse claims. And these previous claims um, have been really immensely helpful for victims, and extending these reforms to victims of child physical abuse will provide just one mechanism for uh, victims to be able to seek justice when they've experienced severe child abuse by an individual or an institution entrusted with their care. And from our perspective, you know, certainly compared with the criminal uh, processes, civil actions have the potential to provide even more meaningful material justice to victims of abuse. And while criminal justice processes are designed to focus on individual culpability uh, related often to specific acts. Civil actions can provide a mechanism for broader accountability and for reform. And I think you heard that um, earlier from uh, the two witnesses that spoke. And importantly, uh, so these civil actions can provide an opportunity to seek damages not only from individuals that caused harm, but also institutions that were entrusted with keeping children safe. And in this way, we think that civil actions have an important role to play in the prevention of further um, or future child abuse. And this particular proposal that you're looking at today um, will really provide these kinds of opportunities for victims of child abuse whose lives have been irrevocably altered by their experience of abuse. And these victims can in include child victims of severe household domestic violence um, and victims of child abuse experienced in an in institutional setting. And I've, I know you've heard several examples already of that. The current three-year statute of limitations related to act, uh, these particular civil actions really sets forth a timeline that has no relation to the dynamics of the sort of abuse or challenges that victims face in coming forward. For many individuals, it can take years to really fully understand the scope and impact of abuse that they experienced in childhood. And even um, once that is realized, it can take even longer to navigate the complicated process of taking action to seek various paths of justice against those that were entrusted with keeping them safe. And so lifting these limits really expands victims' ability to seek healing um, on a timeline that, that is more reasonable and, um, and is frankly um, more evidence-based when we look at uh, the way the amount of time that it does take for many victims to come forward and disclose. Um, and I just wanted to note two additional items that had come up previously in discussion this morning. Um, one was something that Senator Baruth uh, brought up. And I would just offer that one additional item for potential consideration uh, by the committee is whether Vermont statutes regarding access to records by victims after they reach adulthood whether any of those statutes need to be strengthened. Um, and in many cases of abuse, victims seek to really make sense of their memories um, and experiences by seeking available documentation about their care. And I know that in the case of um, the St. Joe's survivors and many others that I've spoken with, access to records have, has posed a significant barrier to healing uh, for victims in the past. And, so that may be an, an area for additional, additional consideration. I don't have any particular language recommendations today, but um, if the committee was interested in pursuing that line of inquiry, I'd certainly be willing to um, be part of those conversations. And then the last is um, just in regards to um, child abuse and what we are seeing today, one of the things that the network does is house the program that trains nurses to provide 
um, those specialized exams to victims of domestic and sexual violence. And that also includes um, providing exams to pediatric patients. And so those might be pediatric um, victims of child sexual abuse or child physical abuse. And I did want to note that um, in 2020, 318 adults and 67 children in Vermont um, sought those specialized exams. And that's just a subset of the total that are seeking medical care for suspected um, you know, adult or child um, abuse. And that was almost twice as many as the cases that we saw in 2019. And I just share that by way of saying that it was a really surprising, it was really surprising for us because <laughs> overall um, healthcare utilization was down in 2020. But what we saw was almost twice as many people seeking um, specialized care for uh, exams related to abuse that they experienced. So I think that this proposal is timely um, and we support it. Thank you, Sarah. Are there questions for Sarah? I, I guess one question is frequently um, in domestic violence cases, we hear of where children were taken into the um, doctor's office and examined, and sometimes it's questionable whether it was the broken arm as a result of abuse or that fall down the stairs. Um, is that the type of case you're talking about where the records are not yes. available? Uh, I'm, yep. I'm trying to understand the records. Yep. So I think it, it would be those records. It could also be records related to children that are in um, state's custody or in a placement, um, in some kind of placement that they're unable to access those records. It could also be related to adoption records. Um, and Amy Brady from um, Voices may be able to speak to this um, in greater depth, uh, but I know that many people who experience abuse and then are um, placed in a different household and permanently um, placed with another family often have a really difficult time in going back and seeking any records related to their adoption after they, um, after they are adults. Um, and so that um, that may be one additional area for consideration. Yeah. I, well, I was a subject of an out-of-state adoption, so um, you, you can just guess how difficult it is to uncover any information from Massachusetts. Um, for some, not all the, the records are difficult. But I, I was wondering more about those types of allegations of child physical abuse and you know that because of the intimidation the mother would say that, that he fell down the flight of stairs the, the father's obviously the doctor can't can't prove but those records are there somewhere and maybe years later the kid relives those i think uh, i i think that's exactly yeah, exactly and so, it and so there may there be Sorry, I'm getting an echo. Uh, there may be, uh, you know, medical records. There may be educational records or various institutional records um, that could be really helpful to adult victims as they're trying to make sense of their experience. All right. Thank you, Sarah, Thank you. very much. Our next witness is uh, Mary Kehoe, an attorney with the Kehoe Law Firm. Mary, welcome to Senate Judiciary. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, uh, where would you like to start, Senator Sears? Well, um, your interest in this bill. Okay. Thank you. How um, it would. I have recently. Help people um, that you represent. I'm sorry. And people that you represent, how it would help. Okay. Um, well, I don't actually represent anyone. I've been assisting uh, individuals who are survivors of St. Joe's uh, on sort of an ad hoc basis, um, uh, working with Mark Wenberg and uh, victims. Um, and can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. Thank you. Um, so in talking with them and looking at the bill that Senator Pearson's introduced, um, it, you know, the 
concern is how do some of these people obtain redress for the harms that they experienced as children? And I know that Senator uh, Pearson is interested in this as well. And it just simply occurred to me as an attorney whose career was primarily focused on family law, uh, that one um, way of looking at this in terms of waiving the statute of limitations without opening the floodgates, so to speak, would be to take a look at the standards that are in uh, Vermont's relief from abuse statutes as they relate to children. I'm certainly no expert in that particular area, relief from abuse statutes as relate to children. Most of my career was focused on helping domestic partners, not so much children. But I do know that in order to obtain a relief from abuse order to protect a child, one can do so if one can establish that the harm to the child is so severe that it impacts their emotional development as defined in Title 33, which is the Chin, colloquially known as the Chins Statute. So I would encourage uh, the Judiciary Committee in considering Senator Pearson's bill to take a look at that statute to see if that is a standard that the committee could, so to speak, wrap its arms around in considering waiving uh, the statute of limitations for people who experience that kind of harm as children. They would have to establish the harm. And I don't think it's very easy. You would have to have someone probably an expert uh, to establish that the person, now an adult, experienced that level of harm as a child. It's worth considering. I haven't delved into it in great detail, and please let me assure you I'm no expert at this. I know that you have other witnesses. I see um, Jerry O'Neill's name here as a witness who are, have far more expertise than I do. But I just think it's one area that you could look because honestly, I know that Senator Pearson is concerned about opening the floodgates, but honestly, when I took a look at his bill, his proposed bill, it occurred to me that there are precious few people that that bill would really help, at least the, those that I've been in contact with who are survivors of uh, their occupancy at St. Joe's many, many years ago. Um, few of them experienced um. <laughs> aggravated assault, but many of them experienced severe emotional trauma based on the way they were uh, handled as children. So I would encourage the committee to take a look at Title 33, have Ledge Council take a look at that and see if that covers- Well, I think we could- Sorry, go ahead. That's the sort of thing that, well, here's my problem. We're not even supposed to be taking up Senate bills right now. And because of the timeliness of this bill, I'm taking it up. If we were to expand further to the, the Title 33 relief from abuse standards, I, I don't think we can do that this year. I think that's something that um, we would need to look at. Sure, in the understood. Future. Um, right now, um, I, I'm just, um, I think that does complicate the issue, uh, trying to do that. And I, um, and Senator Pearson's bill is, you know, I'm trying to take it up because it seems timely to me and important yes. that we deal with this. Um, but getting into those types of standards, um, we need to, to look for it. I don't think any state has gone that route that yeah. I'm aware of. Oh, I also think you'd have to have um, other parameters in order to avoid, in my, this is just my opinion as a citizen, to avoid um, casting too large a net uh, with this uh, bill. One thought I had, and again, these are just my thoughts in speaking with these individuals who, as I'm sure you all know, um, you know, have suffered some severe harm. It's hard not to feel very compassionate about them. Yeah. Um, one yeah. thought I had is that you could limit the waiver of the statute to institutions, right? Because institutions have, I think, um, a greater responsibility to all of us um, 
when you're entrusting a child in their care and they hold themselves out as um, a, a facility that has the capacity to provide that care. I think it would be um, very different when it's in a strictly private context within, for example, the scope of a family. So I would be in favor of taking a look at whether it would be wise to limit the scope of the waiver of the statute to institutions who hold themselves out as having uh, expertise and, and, and honestly get paid, right? Get paid or get some sort of compensation for what they do. I think they mm -hmm. should be held to a higher standard. Um, next week, we hope to hear from some of the survivors of um, some of this trauma and that may help make our judgments about where to go and how to deal with this whole. Um, yeah, inform us um, as working with the survivors. What have you discovered that you didn't expect to find? Anything? Um, well, I know that uh, Mr. O'Neill probably knows a lot more about this um, than I do. I uh, here's what I, I I have discovered just personally that it's um, a, a highly concerning issue. When I first got involved with these folks, um, as anyone, I, I took a look at the materials they sent me. And the first thing I thought is, oh boy, this is gonna take me a lot of time. Uh, and I started watching and I couldn't break myself away from what they wrote, what they said, what you know, songs they composed, poems they written, they've written about the experiences they had. I read the article of, uh, by the journalist whose name I cannot recall, but I think she's from Australia, um, that I couldn't tear myself away. What, what happened to these people is honestly horrific. Um, and um, they are now feeling it more now than when they were children, of course, because they don't have a voice when they're children. You know, I mean, it's, it's really hard not to feel extraordinarily compassionate and, and, and not take active action as I'm doing pro bono. I mean, I'm just doing this as a citizen who has uh, time on her hands. Um, it's hard not to wanna to take action to provide these people some relief. They're hurting. I'm, I, I really do hope you have a chance to, I know you're so, so busy, but to lay out the time to um, listen to these uh, folks and what they have to say. And I, I, I you know, since you're all sitting here now, I, I feel comfortable in saying that I assure you, you will all react the way I did in speaking with them and reading what they had to say. And I hope you can find the time, not necessarily this year. I'm sure that will require some work. I see uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick's uh, name on the screen here and Ledge Council would have to really study this. I mean, obviously you all have to seriously consider the consequences of the actions you take. Um, but I think this is one Senator Sears that really deserves that uh, time and effort. If not this year, then next year. And I would well, certainly be happy to help in any way I can. There's been discussions between the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Senate Education Committee and the Senate Health and Welfare Committee about next steps, uh, mainly regarding the current Hatton situation, which yes. is very similar. Um, yep. We have both charges of sexual abuse and uh, physical abuse, um, and whether how that moves in the and what we do, whether it's go through the child protection committee, that the legislative joint um, child protection oversight committee, or it goes through a um, separate. Committee. We're going to continue to look at these issues and these institutions, specifically those two, um, and their impact yeah. on kids in Vermont and survivors of those. Um, <clears throat> but this bill is specifically one thing that we think we could do to bring some relief to some kids. They're no yeah. longer kids, obviously. To some children who were abused, <clears throat> physically abused in those situations. They obviously, because Vermont, I think, was 
extremely proactive in his communities who have for some of that on, on the child sexual abuse. And I don't know what the impact has been of that law from years ago, whether there have been a lot of cases filed or haven't been. But um, now we're looking at the child physical abuse that occurred in some of these. Um, when it gets to the emotional trauma, it's harder to quantify. Um, and sure. That that's but that again is where I would say that that um, whatever we end up with the three committees in the Senate looking at uh, issues rising from current happening, but certainly um, yep. a similar, a eerily sure. similar here. Uh, yep. Uh, well, the. Are there other questions, Mary, from committee members or comments that you want? We look forward to hearing from some of those folks next week. And um, my heart goes out to them, you know, what's happened to them. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And I, I'm grateful that you're taking a look at this and doing what you can to address these issues for yeah, folks. There, like there's also, um, I should mention that the attorney general asked for, I think, a little over $25,000, which is in H315 um, for the survivors yeah. to help with the wellness program for those survivors. And, uh, it's, it's in H315, which uh, the Senate's passed and the House hasn't yet agreed with our version. I don't think it's over that small I'm amount. aware of that. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Welcome. Good Amy, time. it's good to see you here. Thank you. Amy Brady, representing the um, Voices for Children. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. For the record, my name is Amy Brady, and I'm a policy associate with Voices for Vermont's Children. I applaud the work that this committee and others have done to remove the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse and support broadening the scope of that statute to include physical abuse through S99. My intent is to keep my testimony brief. In addition to my testimony, I have sent the committee Rosemary LaPuma's publication entitled Decategorizing Child Abuse, Equally Devastating Acts Require Equally Solicitous Statutes of Limitation. Rosemary outlines other state statutes, names the inequities that exist within those statutes, explains the individual and community impact of childhood trauma, counters the common opposition to statute of limitation changes, and speaks to the necessity of the bill before you. It is my understanding that this bill was drafted in response to a request from St. Joseph's Restorative Inquiry. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to thank them for bringing this issue forward and to extend that gratitude to the bill sponsors as well as this committee for listening to them. We know that trauma leaves people vulnerable and can, have, can often strip them of power and voice. Centering survivors and restructuring our systems redistributes power and has the potential to heal past wrongs while creating meaningful and visionary changes to our current structure. In addition to repealing the statute of limitations, Voices for Vermont's Children recommends looking into the current barriers to accessing records. Without access to records, the burden of proof is difficult to overcome. While we cannot undo past harm, we can create the context for healing. When we allow the people who have abused others to continue to hold the stories of those they have harmed, we are getting in the way of the truth and reconciliation process. In conclusion, Voices for Vermont's Children fully supports S99 and looks forward to working with this committee and others to address proactive measures to prevent abuse. We also support removing barriers to healing, especially those that have been unearthed by survivors all around the state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, 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 briefly glanced at the decategorizing child abuse acts um, that you have put on, we, we have posted to the committee website. Are there particular areas that you, I mean, it's uh, 140 pages, I think. Um, it is, although so the, the section of area? 
just um, six or seven. And so I can highlight those and send that back. Um, mm -hmm. I think that she just did a really good job of kind of going through um, why this matters, sort of what other states have worried about, what has happened when they change statutes. There's an example of um, Oregon in particular with a case study um, and why, um, why this matters for kids long-term as, as they grow up. And um, she, she speaks a lot about ACEs, which I know that the legislature has heard about um, for a number of years, but sort of the financial and um, lifelong impacts of trauma and how civil um, removal of statute of limitations can, can help um, to at least compensate folks for, for the extra expenses that they've had to endure um, because of the trauma they've experienced. Are there any comments regarding access to records that you could help me with be a little more specific? Thank you. I, I did hear that question um, for Sarah as well. And I think, you know, for the most part, from my understanding is that medical records are fairly easy to access if people know the providers to go to. Um, what I've heard more and more is that youth who transition out of state care, particularly those who don't have a permanency plan, who um, transition into independence without um, a family to connect with, often have a really hard time accessing their records after their time in state care. And they do not even know the providers to seek their records from um, because they don't have access to their full story. Um, I also saw the list of um, hopes and aspirations that um, the folks from St. Joe's put together. And I noted that on their list, they also asked for their own individual records. And I think that they've been working on that for some time and still haven't been able to get them. And it just feels like, you know, it's a common theme, whether it's somebody who's been in state custody or somebody who's been in an institution where they know um, where the records are kept. They've gone through, you know, due process trying to um, get access to them and have been denied. Thank you. Other questions from Amy? Senator Bruce, you're uh, Yeah, quick, quick follow up. Um, can you specify a little what, what is the basis under which they're denied? So I believe, and you know, we would have to ask, um, I think the state probably more about this, but I believe that youth who have transitioned out of state care in particular have access to specific parts of their file, they need to be redacted. Um, I think sometimes those files are hard to locate. I think sometimes um, there's been barriers to doing that. And I don't know if it's because the redaction process takes staff time or, um, I really don't know, honestly. But what I okay. do know is that there are many youth who have repeatedly in writing and, and you know gone through the complaint process trying to access their records and have not been able to do so. Um, I think that they're supposed to be able to see them in the office and then request specific sections to take home with them. And even the, even seeing um, their educational and their medical records within the office hasn't been granted in many cases. Seems so odd to me because I, I usually associate redaction with national security. Um, in this case, given that they're the individual to whom the record pertains, it's hard to see the justification for redacting their own record. Um, I think the reason behind that is because oftentimes a child's file includes um, health records of the, their family. And so while it's their own record, there's often information in their file that pertains to other people that they might not have access to. I see, okay. Thank you. The, the, the records are sometimes so old that um, they may not have redacted everything they thought they were going to, to um, or they may have over-redacted. Um, I, I, I don't know if I was supposed to find out my my name was Stephen, actually my first name was Stephen when I was born. Wow. Could have been different, you know, Stephen. <laughs> I don't know if I was supposed to find that out. <clears throat> anyway, the, those are the types of things that are in records that you just can't access. Uh, 
I don't know if Senator White's committee has um, usually does records types of things, and I don't know what. And that's assuming that kids were in states custody. Many of the kids at St. Joseph's and Manhattan were not in states custody. So. That is true, and I think you'll if you ask them next week, I think you'll hear that they're having equally difficult time getting access to their files. And and just her, I don't know. Um, we don't deal with. Um, individual records, but with public records requests um, in terms of somebody else requesting a record, but individuals records um, are usually available to the individual with, as Amy pointed out, the um, redaction necessary to protect other people. Okay. Um, I, I, any other questions for Amy committee? Um, Zoom through this Zoom? No, that's not the right term. We, we are ahead of schedule. So Eric, maybe we could talk a little bit about further. Um, uh, are there other questions that the committee wants to ask to look at um, as we continue to work on S99? Yes. I just ask Eric a question. I'm just thinking about cases whereby someone is emotionally <clears throat> unstable later in life and they did go through a home or they're in their own home for instance even and they were not really severely abused by their parents but say emotional abuse does that come under here too that later on they are experiencing problems and maintain that they were emotionally abused in their home are those cases uh would they also come under here the way it's written now <clears throat> would not apply to just emotional abuse, no. Okay. It's just, uh, there has to be some physical injury. Right. I'm also thinking of some other cases whereby um, in times past, a substantiated abuse might've been if um, a parent, I, I can think of one case of whereby uh, a parent slapped their child across the face because they were swearing at them and when the, in doing so, it must have hit them hard enough that it, it left a mark on their face. And so that case was substantiated. And so say that um, the child went on in life and said, you know, I was an emotional problem. I'm still suffering um, because of this kind of thing from my parents. And, and that piece about the slap in the face could be substantiated because that might be in a record because it was founded. So are those the kind of, I mean, I, I suppose you could try anything, but. But, um, but would that be considered aggravated assault because there was no intent to <clears throat> cause serious bodily harm or death? I guess that would be the argument. I, I don't know, Eric. I would say not. It's, I, I agree, Senator White, that um, it probably would not come under the definition of aggravated assault because it would not, seemed to be mm -hmm. it wouldn't cause serious bodily injury and was not conduct that was uh, manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life so uh, a slap in a parental context doesn't doesn't seem to me to rise to that standard it would be assault but not aggravated assault correct yeah but it may not even be assault well, i mean i, I one of the charges in Kern Hatton is that the kids were required to stand for long periods of time. That may have also been at St. Joseph, they were required to stand at long periods of time as punishment, stand in place. Um, would that be, which causes can cause them that, that sort of thing? Not really. That would seem like a difficult case to make for to meet that standard. Um, but then the kid that was kicked across, kicked across the floor, who knees buckled, would be. That's potential, yeah. That could be serious bodily injury. Um, you know, kicking someone to the floor, does that show extreme indifference to the value of human life? Is that, uh, or, reckless conduct that someone might arguably know could cause someone to inadvertently die. You know, again, not an easy case to make, but you know, the, the more severe the 
harm, the more at least possible it seems like a claim could be made out. Thank you. Eric, or comments from the committee on where we go from here? The only thing I, I had forgotten to mention, and just to, again, it's a, uh, a legal point that the committee had talked about in the context of the childhood sexual abuse statute as well, is just, uh, uh, and you, you know, the mayor may not, there was a lot of testimony about this two years ago. It may not come up again now, because, but there is this sort of outstanding constitutional question about reviving uh, claims that have been expired. Still hasn't been resolved. I think the, the cases I've seen, there are cases on both sides. It seems like the majority of cases say it's okay, it, it's, but there are a few that say it causes due process problems. Um, just as Can we you always explain do. that. Yes, yeah, so the idea is that um, once the uh, statute of limitations has run, that someone gains a vested right in uh, not being able to be sued for that conduct anymore because the the limitations period has run. Um, couple, of, there's been a few courts that have said that, and that's a due process issue. Um, but the majority of courts that I've seen, Massachusetts uh, Supreme Court, Connecticut Supreme Court, for example, have said that there is no vested right that's acquired um, in that situation and distinguishes it from, you may recall, we've talked about this, in the criminal situation, the person does acquire a right. When, once a criminal statute of limitations expires, um, the person, you can't retroactively extend it for the person but those cases have distinguished the criminal and civil statutes and said uh, um, it was not a due process problem. I just like to flag it for the committee so that it's not a surprise if it ever comes up. And there have been a few minority courts that have said that um, just so it's not a surprise later on. I want to mention Thank earlier, you. I just forgot. Thanks. Gary, did you have a comment on that? Yeah. Um, only briefly, I haven't reread the case in preparation for this, because I didn't expect the issue, but I believe that there is a case that comes out of the retroactive provision of the statute from 1989 or 1990, when the child sexual abuse statute was changed to permit the bringing of an action within six years to the time that someone discovers the difficulty they're experiencing has been caused by the abuse. And I believe, and again, I'd want to reread the case on it, but I believe the Vermont Supreme Court had no trouble with the retroactivity provision and uh, ruled that it was lawful. I think the distinction, Gary, is that it, it hadn't expired yet. It, that's true that they were they they retroactively extended it, but but the I don't think the statute the limitations period had fully expired. Um, that was my reading of it, but. Uh, yeah, I'd have to, re I, it's, it's yeah. not how I remember it, but I don't claim to remember things correctly. So I'd want to reread it as well. <laughs> uh, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> That's why they have provision. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know that that works, by the way. That was not an ad. For that. <laughs> uh, okay. Any other comments? I don't want to. Um, belabor the point. Peggy um, and witnesses, thank you all very much.